Hello, beautiful beings, to Earth Star Talk. Today is Wednesday the 18th, and uh, I had a request from Devi Fjordov about uh, a circle, which you kind of sort of see here in my back. And um, that's a stone circle. I took her picture to demonstrate a little bit also in regard of her questions that they don't always have to be huge and tall like Stonehenge. They can be smaller as well. So this stone circle, she asked me whether it's druid, it felt druid, and what the druids actually did with this. Now in history, there is a little bit debate whether the stones are not way older than the druids because the druids were seen as the uh, priests of the Celts. And yes, indeed, stone circles were done way before, but the Druids also used stone circles for their own purposes. Ultimately, what Druids are, they are the magicians of nature. They're in tune with nature spirits. They are in tune with the devas, the, um, the, the dryads, the beings of the trees. And of course, they're in tune with the ley lines, the energy lines. In one of my further uh, foremost recordings, I was talking about that ley lines can be detected in your own backyard by looking at the tree as uh, trunks of two trees and then the energy line goes directly through. Now, when you have a crisscross of those lines, you might find trees which have several trunks. So you might have like a little mini vortex by a tree having building out four, five, six trunks. Some of the trunks might be a little bit more, um, you know, further apart. And there is a major energy line or ley line going through. But mostly when you have these trees with several trunks, it's like a little mini vortex. And Druids and the ones before the Druids who utilize nature magic, or what is the word of magic, to really tune in and harness the power of nature, Mother Nature, the David realm, all the uh, animal kingdom realms, the spirit animal realms, and they were using them even before the Druids came and do use them with their Celtic heritage. So ultimately, we're talking not just about the Druids, but we're talking about um, ancient tribes way before on the British Isles and Ireland and Scotland and so on. Um, however, because of the Druids going to sea with the Vikings and so on. The Vikings, as you know, were a seafaring folk and very strong and conquering. And um, the further they went, you have no clue how far, far they came. They were here way beyond of what we consider the Native American populace um, spreading here in um, America or in the Americas. They were here and left some residue. And the, the shamans or the Celtic Druids who came with them definitely brought with them their traditions and left their mark. I'm not sure how old this stone circle is. I cannot really tune into this uh, picture in designating a time frame for its making. But um, consider that it was in, found in an island, Bowen Island in British Columbia. I would say it could be authentic Druid because of the seafaring part of the Vikings. They have been found, you know, there were some rune stones found uh, on the eastern side of America. And I would not be surprised if some. Um, Boats were arriving also by British Columbia. Now, 
what were done, what things were done with the stone circles? Again, I would say the stone circles were an augmentation of the energy lines, the ley lines of a area of importance energetically. So each stone functions like a little bit acupuncture point on a glade or on a energy spot and was augmenting by marking. These are like stone markers of energy spots where energy lines come together. Now you can, I'm getting chills, so you can consciously work with the stones and make them do things. I do that when I do house clearings, I'm using crystals. If there is a lane line going through a house and I need to circumvent the energy around the house that the people who own a home are not bothered by the transient spirits all the time or by the tremendous energy flow all the time. So these stones were used to um, create a flow. And sometimes the flow is a circular one, especially when you have a, let me do a little um, drawing here. I'm not sure whether we can see that. Now let me explain it first. So you have energy lines which cross. So how do you do a ceremonial ground of crossing lines? You unfold the lines and you put them in a certain alignment so that they're circling around each other and create like an energy tornado effect or an energy hurricane effect, you know? You, you're creating a funnel. How do you do that? Of course, you can do it with tons of tons of material of stones, but with these smaller stones, which we see in the pictures, you can clink them together, like bong them together and set, some, set them aside or set them in the ground. And then you take a different one and bong that to the next one and set it down and take another one and bomb it again and set it down. What that means when you clunk stones together like this, they create a polarity, an electromagnetic polarity in the stone. So they become like a battery and like a battery plus and minus pole, they will be creating a current. So these stones then directing the earth ley line electromagnetic current, natural current current, and direct it a little bit into a circle. And with that circle inspiring, you know, the energy builds up and it creates a dynamic. With that then I'm getting chills again. So this is important to understand. When spirit gives me information and they want to emphasize it, it's just like the hair on my arm stand up. I don't know whether you can see it, but it's definitely it gives me goosebumps. So it is something to consider. Ultimately, when you're talking about that and you find a spot in your own backyard where you have these trees with several trunks or you have the trees with two trunks and then more and more and more come behind it. And so you have a major energy line. You could do the same thing. You could take crystals. That what maybe would be the easiest and clump them together, set down the next one, clump it together on the side, set down and so on and create a dynamic field if you do it correctly. And it would then do the same thing like these stone circles do, create a little whirlwind of energy, a little mini vortex, or here even a bigger vortex where you could do ceremonies. Uh, Debbie sent me a nice little video I cannot show here, but she felt when entering into the circle, she felt like thrilling, like dancing, like enjoying nature, like enjoying the elements, like being in one with the elements full of joy. When we know that positive emotions are the rocket fuel in our life and negative emotions make us shrink, what do you think is positive for any kind of nature magic? Joy. So that definitely could be a celebrational ground where things were um, enacted to manifest. Yeah? A lot of the ceremonies of the Celtic tradition, like Beltane and so on, they were ceremonies done in a union with nature. 
celebrating nature, celebrating the cycles. The humans at that time were in union with the natural cycle of the Earth's environment. So they lived with it instead of against it, like we oftentimes do. Um, so if you want to create your own ceremonial ground, I would recommend for you again to look at the ley lines and then use the crystals like they did the stones here. Um, stones, no matter which one, have of course a crystalline structure. So when you do clear quartz crystals, it is very pure energy of light. Now, not everywhere do you find clear quartz crystals to work with. So they use this more basalt stones with a certain crystalline matrix. And again, they were very in tune with the stones. And even stones, when they are not polished, can harbor a spirit, a nature spirit. So the Druids knew how to deal with nature spirits. I was allowed to witness it myself in a seminar with the elephants from the Silverdorp tree elf tribe called the Dusty Mellards, 13 and 14. In the seminar in a old uh, Druid space in Mount St. Odile uh, in Europe, which had been, I almost want to say had a Mayan feel to it because there were blocks on that mound which were square, perfectly fitted together. And they were almost like a bastion of stones which gave the feeling of a fortress. And on top of there was a forest and in the forest were stones and the stones had hollows and you could see that it was made to make water or oil or whatever flow from one to another to another. And there were almost like seating areas where people were laying back. You could, you could see it, you could feel it, you could energetically see it as well. And of course, on top of the mountains, there were ley lines. In the woods, you could see them clearly and they were going directly through the stones, through the natural stones, which were then carved for a certain purpose. But not only that, um, that mound had a living uh, well with healing waters, very specific minerals in the water, which were good for the body. Um, and not only that, it was again, this energy place, like a fountain of energy was coming out of that uh, Mount Santo Dio. So, I saw their carvings, which are also found in Germany in the Steiner, my favorite old Druid place. They had carved out the form of a body like a sarcophagus in Egypt, but more form to the body that you now had the exact pointing where north was or where the head was supposed to be and the toes. So you couldn't lay in the wrong way. And these kind of sarcophagus like carvings or these tomb like carvings uh, were absolute in the open towards the stars. And you could lay in them and you could feel the flow rushing from the ley lines through your body. To me, when I looked at that at Mount Santo Dio, it was an initiation place where the novices were laying down and emerge in the energy flow of Mother Earth, the ley lines, the energy lines, but also exposed to the stars uh, and certain star constellation. Interestingly enough, there was a little chapel because later this place was appropriated by the Christians and there were monks and later nuns who created a um, cloister on top of that mount. So you see this place was very attractive to all sorts of people along the centuries. And in this little chapel were depicted star constellations, specific star constellations, unfortunately I don't have a picture uh, handy right now. But when these people were laying, the novices were laying in, they were connecting with the stars and the star constellation. So uh, who am I to say what exactly were they were experienced at their initiation? 
But I would say that they were connecting with their starry brethren or their earth star, their core star. So they were here, this star on earth, but connecting with their starry self, with their higher self, with the core self, the star of one, the oneness, the being of who they really are. And Mother Earth gave them the extra energy to get out of their body and to promote this energy link between their physical body and their spirit body high up in the skies, in the ethers, in the higher dimension. So definitely an initiation of who they really are as eternal soul, as multidimensional being. Very powerful place. If you ever go to the area of Mount Saint Odile, in Europe, I would heartily invite you to figure it out and maybe sneak up in one of these hollows and lay yourself down and maybe even at night and um, on an auspicious day of the year, maybe on your birthday, because uh, even Anastasia of the Ringing Seals of Russia says it is a very, um, a very important time to be under the stars when you have your birthday. Try it out. But coming back to um, Devi Fjordov's question about the circle. So she experienced firsthand the energy dynamics in this beautiful uh, stone circle. And I wouldn't say it doesn't really matter how old it is or whether it was recently or fairly recently created. The matter of the thing is that the stones were put in to augment the energy and to create this energy as well. And I explained a little bit how it was done. I also um, mentioned earlier about the Druid uh, sarcophagus kind of um, scenario in the extant China, my favorite place, because I live in German, I am German. And so it was my favorite hangout at one point in time. And Druids work a lot with the energy of dragons. And I'm going to have a guest down the line uh, in our little Earth Talk show, uh, a lady who works a lot with dragon energy. And the Extensteine is ultimately the, the stone of the dragons, where a spirit um, of a dragon entity uh, manifested itself and worked with spirits and the Druids. And Therefore, they have an um, initiation place too. Now, this was partially artificially created to augment the energy line with water because water is a great conductor for electricity or electromagnetic fields. So when you lay down in the Extenstein tomb there, they had a um, kind of like a bow of stone over it or almost like a cave-like structure over it. And there were steps. And if people follow me on Instagram on uh, Psychic Claudia, I have some of these pictures there and uh, where my son lays in one of them. And I have a picture of my foot like um, showing the steps onto this uh, cave-like structure on top, uh, carved out of a natural stone there. And how I pictured they, these druids were standing on top while the initial, uh, initiate was laying in the um, almost like sarcophagus kind of style and was dragged into what they called the underworld, but actually dragged out of their body and then going through their different layers of spirit. Yes, the underworld as the lower astral level, which divides their oneness energy with our dualarity. Uh, duality energy and then it was through the singing of the druids which no, knew exactly what they were intoning i did an old video about kabbalistic or druid intoning where it was done with the vowels r r e a a e o u the vowel sound and um, how to do it so that your brain gets um, activated and you're operating on both parts of the brain so they knew all these sort of things and so they were singing to again augment the energy flow through the initiate's body. Very fascinating stuff, at least to me. So coming back to the circle here. So she was asking me then and showed me another picture, which was a little confusing here on the Zoom recording background um, about you know, these clusters of trees. You see some trees here in the background, but you don't see so many 
in this angle which have two or three or four or five trunks, but she found them. And that is very typical, as I mentioned in the very beginning of the discourse today about the truths and their um, workings. When you have these crisscross lines, these were done and used always by the jewels for their workings. So that's when you were told that the jewels were in glades and caves and such. The glades they used were always that where energy lines were crossing, always. And oftentimes we hear, hear about a glade with a circle of trees around. And, you know, in the legends, it talks about fairies. But what it ultimately is, it opens us and our third eye and our spirit centers, our energy bodies up to the extrasensory perception to perceive these um, fine energies of the spirit folk in nature. Oh, and I mentioned earlier about nature and the Dusty Millers. So these Dusty Millers work with tree spirits. They call them dryads. And when you say the word dryad, it's ultimately that every tree in your arena looks at you and say, who called us by name or who called us by spirit? So the dryad, when you say that word dryad, is a frequency, I mean, it's a frequency that the trees recognize, oh, we are dressed right now. So when you work with trees, um, say dryad of this and this tree, my name is this and this, and I would like to work with you. And I would like, you know, introduce yourself to the tree before you get into a flow with the tree energy and spirit. And you can use the trees just, just like the ley lines because they are connected there. And trees which have two trunks or more are more interested in the environment of what's going on. Otherwise trees use us like we them. Oh, nice tempestry. Oh, they are part of our surrounding, but they're not necessarily willing and open to work with other species. But the trees which are on ley lines, they are more going beyond what the trees do uh, communicate around the world and seeing things and experiencing things that way by their spirit communication. I've seen auras of spirits of trees where the spirit or the aura of the tree was going to the right and you see these trees communicate and then the same aura of the tree goes to the left and communicates with another um, spirit of a tree. Or so one dryad connects with another dryad and so they can communicate like that with their aura, with their electromagnetic field around the world. Very fascinating to see when you have learned to see auras and when you do it at dusk or dawn, it's uh, way easier, but then you can see the aura of a tree and you can oftentimes see them moving and communicating. So these tribe, the silver dog tree elves, um, and especially the dusty millers in England, I think they are living now in Kent, um, dusty miller 13 and 14, and I might put a link and make myself a note here, link to the Dusty Millers. And the, the 14th uh, of the seventh son of the seventh son is now retired, but the, the 13th, but the 14th is uh, continuing the legacy. He's also the seventh son of the seventh son. So this legendary, um, scenario with the seventh son of the seventh son is actually real and certain times uh, magic uh, interests are passed down through the generations that way. So this person is uh, working still with the conscious of the tree spirits and the dryers donate a living piece of life wood, not that wood, but a living piece of life wood and he is working with these donated pieces, cuts them off, and the tree spirit, the dry, clones itself um, to the little piece of wood. And then they're working with it in a certain way to make it more uh, long lasting because, you know, normal that wood deteriorates over time. But uh, this life wood is prepared so that it can be uh, a host to a tree spirit the clone of the original tree for centuries to come. 
And the interesting part is that these tree spirits know exactly with whom they're going to be working with in the future because they're not going by our time-space continuum. So they knew, know already outside our time-space continuum who will work with them down the line. Very fascinating stuff. I could go on and on and on what I witnessed um, on that seminar with the Dusty Millers. However, what thing which is important for our stone circle workings and working with stone is and understanding the truths at the time um, that they were working consciously with everything in stones. And again, the Dusty Miller, the 14th, was doing a demonstration. We were on Mount Santo Dio, supposed to pick up any kind of pebble. And he said, well, he had a little long pendulum with knots on the, and the knots were showing a certain frequency level. So he had a long, um, like a wool strip with knots and then the pendulum down there. And depending on where he was holding it, it was the frequency of the certain frequency demonstrated when the pendulum was swinging. So when you hold it short, it was a frequency, longer frequency and so on and so forth. It was pretty long, that pendulum, as tall as he was. And um, so he was demonstrating that the pebble, this one particular father who uh, was the father of an autistic child found was swinging at a certain frequency. And it showed also it was alive. It had so a living entity in the stone, a living stone being very ancient, more simple-minded, but still aware. We never consider stones being aware or having an entity in it, right? Or awareness, but not so. The Druids knew that stones, which were not polished necessarily, um, have a life entity to them. So then, um, he, for the father, said, what would you like to accomplish with this pebble you found? And he said, well, I will give it to my son. He loves nature, but he is autistic, so he has its own workings with nature and energy, and it's oftentimes overwhelming. He said, okay, then I will let me ask you this uh, stone being whether he will be accommodating your son for his needs of being grounding and being, you know, digesting certain energies first so that he can work, um, have it in his uh, pocket and feel more grounded and feel less of the electricity going through him and feeling less disruptive in his nervous system. So he was holding the pebble and then doing a certain movement like a trill and then snapped his finger and you could see a flash of light happening around his left hand where he was holding the pebble and I'm still getting chills uh, due this day uh, thinking about that time and space when he did that. So what he was doing, he was combining two energies, one elemental of nature, you know, air has elementals, the soil has elementals, the um, water has elemental spirits. And so he was, I don't know which elemental he combined with the spirit host of the stone, but he definitely did a combination and it was like a little sun and lightning uh, one can hear this ping and the flash of light. So this is how truths work then what we call magic. And even the, the uh, silver dog tree elf people, they still call it the magic workings. So when you do this sort of working at an energy place like this, it's easier because you don't have to use so much of your own life force to do the working. You can use the elemental energy workings. And that brings me um, to the Native Americans who used the elementals and their healing techniques also very much. They didn't use only herbs, but they also used other energies and were sucking them in from nature spirits, trees, smaller plants, even ferns are really great for energy workings, for healing and such things. And 
obviously stones, you know, which you found on a vision crest. You found your particular stones. They were um, stones to uh, uphold your energy, uplift your energy. And the shamans were using the medicine bundles like that for augmenting the person's energy when they were depleted and they were diseased or sick without ease. So in that, uh, druids and uh, shamans uh, in the Native American tradition worked similarly in some overlapping areas. So I can see that the inhabitants of the area there welcomed brethren of different workings because there were so, uh, overlapping similarities. So how Debbie experienced this place was full of joy, happiness, triggered her to dance, triggered her to feel the energy around. So I'm glad that this place there at the Bowen Island in British Columbia is still active. Wonderful. And next to there is a retreat place they were visiting so they could hide from that retreat place to that stone circle. So thank you, uh, Debbie, to bring this to my attention, this beautiful place here. I might visit myself one day when I need to keep up a stone circle. Um, I might also mention that stone circles, for example, in um, Stonehenge, which is one of the most famous ones, um, got additional workings on. One of my soul sisters, Solara, describes in one of her books that she took groups to Stonehenge and they were doing ceremonies with crystals to again augment the energy where there was a disruption in the flow of the stones because some of the stones were used for building in later years by the times when the Druids were ousted and the Christians came in and some of these stones were destroyed and stones were missing so the flow was disrupted. So when you find a stone circle <clears throat> where you feel something is not order, tune in um, in the spiral of energy where there is a disruption and you might bring it back into the flow by using a stone, hold it in your hands, designated for the purpose and ask whether the spirit of the stone is okay working and upholding that energy flow. And when you're getting a yes, yeah, like, yes, I'm happy to assist in that. Plant the stone like a seed into the ground and it will be connecting it. If you might, again, tap it to the already existing neighboring stone, it is easier to uphold the energy flow. And um, you can also see if it's a portrait activation, the depending on what's going on, whether the energy needs to flow upwards. Of course, you're using crystals with a point upwards. If you the energy is needing to go downwards, you're using stones with the crystal point down. If you um, need a portal opening, you use crystals with both points open, uh, you know, up one up and one down to make this flow uh, happening. Um, stone circles can be as strong as gateway to the stars. Not all of them are, but they can. And in this particular one, joy is the gateway to the stars. Because when we have joy, we expand our energy tremendously, our um, electromagnetic field tremendously and multiply it by a bit. So joy can definitely be a gateway to the stars and to celestial connections. Um, that's what we are about here at Earth Star Talk, helping you to reawaken your inner powers, which always exist in you because you're never really disconnected from them. So try things out. I uh, try to be very practical in my approach of the teachings and our talks together. So if you have questions about something you experience or something you want to have more in-depth analysis about or answers to, please feel free to send them to uh, either brilliance at claudiagranger.com or earthstartalk at gmail.com or just answer 
uh, or give a question uh, in the comments below the videos uh, or in comments on Instagram. I will post those on Instagram now too. Thank you so very much. And till next time, I think we will talk about dragons soon and how to work with dragon energy, but there will also be other very exciting things coming up. So if you feel you have something to contrib contribute to the awakening of the world, if you have a business and you're operating in a spiritual field, feel heartily invited to write me and write you on the show. Have a great day all together. Bye-bye.